In the current issue of Life magazine, there's beginning a series of articles entitled The Russian Revolution. Every American should read at least a condensation of this book, written by Dr. Alan Moorhead, the popular historian. The Russian Revolution of 1917 had consequences which today, more than ever, are part of current events. Communism's threat has for 40 years dominated international affairs, and Sputnik itself is presented as an achievement of the revolution. This past week, the President of the United States stood before the Joint Houses of Congress and solemnly declared that communist imperialism had declared war on the West. He said that unless the West awakens out of its lethargy and complacency, our way of life could be doomed. The President warned that it was going to take new sacrifices on the part of Americans if the nation is to meet the challenge of a communist revolution that began in 1917. There are many Americans that have serious doubts about the ability of the Western world to ultimately survive. Many are frankly saying that only God can save us. A minister wrote me this past week urging that we Americans begin praying for the Russian people. He stated that the prayers of the Lord's people in this country can penetrate the Iron Curtain and that it is possible that a spiritual revival would break out in Russia that would have worldwide consequences. All across the nation on New Year's Eve, there were hundreds of prayer meetings in which prayer was offered for peace. The average American realizes that we are now fighting for survival and many for the first time are beginning to give serious thought as to their relationship with God. Today, I would like for us to look at five great men whose prayers were heard by God in their hour of need. Down through history, there have been thousands of crises, and on many of these occasions, men have called upon God and their prayers have been answered. On one occasion, Peter cried, Save me! What a significant cry this is! Peter, like most of us, did not say, save me, until circumstances indicated plainly that there was no other way out. Most of us can see God better when we have our back to the wall. A man in a Midwest factory recently boasted that he did not believe in God. But one day his jacket got caught in the whirling flywheel of a huge machine. My God, help me! He cried over and over again. As a rule, men do not cry out for salvation until they realize they're lost. Our thinking has become so tainted by rationalism and humanism that too few today are conscious of their being lost. The most significant beatitude that Jesus used, it seemed to me, was this one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It could well have read, blessed are those who are conscious of their spiritual poverty. The greatest step, pardon me, the prerequisite for coming to Jesus Christ as Savior is a knowledge that you're a sinner and that you are lost away from God. The underlying cause of men's rejection of Christ is their failure to believe that they're lost. If we ministers under the anointing of God's Spirit and upon the authority of the Bible could break through the armor of unbelief and cause men to recognize that they are irreparably lost in the sight of God, I believe there would be a great turning to Christ in America. Jonathan Edwards, that mighty New England revivalist of the 19th century, preached a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and 500 people accepted Christ in one service. It is said in that meeting where the lostness of man was so vividly portrayed that sinful men were drawn to Christ with such power that many gripped the pillars of the church to keep from accepting Christ. God often permits circumstances to occur which cause us to cry, Lord, save me. In Peter's case, we read, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. For many of you today, the winds of circumstances have become boisterous. You have blamed everyone and everything for your present predicament. But God is trying to get you to see that it is you that are lost. Like Peter of old, you are beginning to sink. Perhaps financially, socially, and spiritually, you're on the downgrade. There's always the inevitable descent in the path that leads away from God. Before it is too late, I beg of you to confess your sins and cry with Peter, Master, save me, or I perish. And Jesus will hear your prayer as he heard the prayer of the dying thief who said, Lord, remember me. And Christ turned to him on the cross and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Whatever your circumstances, troubles, and difficulties, Christ will answer your prayer. If in desperation you cry to him, save me. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you will call upon God in repentance and faith, he will save you from your sins and give you the assurance that if you died that you would go to heaven. Secondly, David cried, 
search me. This prayer of David came out of a heart of frustration and spiritual defeat. Listen, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. The cry, search me, should be the theme of every child of God. This attitude of resignation reveals a spirit of consecration which is always pleasing to God and inevitably invokes His blessings. It reveals a head-down, hands-up attitude which enables God not only to find the sin in our lives but to discover the latent talents and possibilities which can be used in His service. Evan Roberts, the leader of the famous Welch Revival, an obscure coal miner, prayed for years, Oh God, bend me. God recognized the humility of this young man, and through him came one of the mightiest spiritual awakenings of the centuries. As we prepare, even now, to go to the Caribbean for the next few weeks, our prayer is that of Evan Roberts. Oh God, bend us, search us, and see if there be any wicked way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. If the revival we need comes to America, which I earnestly pray that it will, it will come when God's people fall on their knees and pray this prayer with David. Search me, O God, and know my heart. The answer to divorce, ladies and gentlemen, is the salvation of divorcees. The answer to teenage delinquency is the salvation of the teenager. The answer to corrupt business and labor leaders is the salvation of the leaders who are involved in corruption. All of our problems which stagger the experts who seem so concerned about the future of America can be resolved at the foot of the cross and in the conversions of different people who are involved. Thirdly, Moses cried, show me. Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. This is one of the most beautiful prayers ever uttered by man. In this prayer, Moses, the mild, meek leader of Israel, recognizes the need of divine guidance and spiritual vision. Among the things that man lost in the fall in the Garden of Eden was spiritual sight and perception. Although Satan had promised that his eyes should be open, in reality, after that act of disobedience, his spiritual eyesight was gone. Such are the false promises of Satan. Sin blinded the eyes of Samson. Sin blinded the eyes of Saul. Sin blinds the eyes of every son of man who persist in it. Only the light of Christ can cause the scales of sin to fall from blinded eyes and restore spiritual vision. All of the world's blundering, stumbling, and bungling is a result of its failure to allow Christ his rightful preeminence in all things. Moses, having been assigned to a seemingly impossible job of leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, realized that he must have divine guidance and assistance. Hence this classic prayer, show me thy way. Impossibilities became probabilities. The difficult became easy and the insurmountable is surmounted when God is taken into account and his leadership is recognized. Thank God for a few leaders in Washington who are beginning to pray, God, show us the way. Thank God for godly ministers who in the face of an indifferent people are praying, God, show us the way. Thank God for consecrated parents who concerned about the drift of their children are praying, God, show us the way. Every Christian aware of his weakness in a world where sin abounds should pray, Lord, God, show us the way. But when God shows the way, Strength must be given to walk in that way. So that brings us fourthly to Samson's cry when Samson cried, Strengthen me. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee that I may be avenged of the Philistines. This sense of spiritual inadequacy is characteristic of the true child of God. Samson's complete lack of power was due, of course, to his breaking his covenant with God and to the departure of God's spirit from his life. Most of our powerlessness today can be traced to a like source. God's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but our sins have separated between us and our God. Sin weakens, but righteousness in Christ makes strong. The popular conception that to be a Christian is a sign of moral weakness and that living for Christ is for women, old people, and children is not true. It takes all of the moral courage a man can muster to stand for God before a world which is quick to ridicule the right and condone the wrong. The Bible emphatically indicates that strength will be given the weak when sought in Christ's name and that right shall ultimately triumph over the might of sin. Listen to the Bible. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mayest still the avenger. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world 
to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. My grace is sufficient for thee, says the Bible, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, said Paul. To a little band of insignificant men, Jesus spoke these words. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. When these words were spoken to that little remote group in an out-of-the-way corner of the world, it seemed very unlikely that these weak, unknown men should ever be heard of outside of their own small province. But such is the power of God and the immutability of His Word. These men, through the power of the Spirit of God, channeled new courses for civilization, debunked and dethroned the idols and ideologies of paganism, authored the world's greatest book, and through their spirit-filled eloquence created a Christendom which has survived the centuries and will outlive the world itself. You that are frustrated and defeated and weakened by the pressures of life, do not be reluctant to call like Samson to Almighty God and say, O oh Lord, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me. Christianity may not be a majority, but it is a powerful minority. It has been the inspiration of the world's greatest music, the theme of the world's greatest literature, the genius behind the world's greatest institutions, and the only power known to man that has been able to accomplish through faith in Christ the transformation and redemption of the human soul. Fifthly, Isaiah cried, Send me. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. This is the cry, ladies and gentlemen, of consecration, the prayer of service. God cannot redeem the world without human instruments with which to work. Christ is the head of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Listen, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. If the church, the body of Christ, fails to live in consecrated personal fellowship with Christ, then Christ will not be known to the world. He provides the strength, the wisdom, and the guidance. But he must use our instrumentality. He has no hands but our hands, no feet but our feet, no voice but our voice to manifest his power, goodness, and grace to a lost, needy, confused, and bewildered world. What Bible is the world reading today? Your daily life and mine. What sermons is the world reading? Your life and mine. What creeds is the world reading? Your daily life and mine. When a hungry world sees that Christianity is feasible, workable, and practical, they are going to accept it like a famished man accepts a steak dinner. It is up to us, God's children, to live victoriously before our friends, loved ones, and acquaintances and to demonstrate that Christianity is all that we proclaim it to be. A Hindu in India recently said, I would become a Christian if I could see one. The world longs to see the professing Christian live as Christ lived. However, Isaiah was told by God to go and preach the prophetic message among the people. Every Christian should be missionary-minded. Whether you go to the foreign field or whether you stay at home, your first concern should be for others who know not the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a little over a week, the members of our team will be in Latin America preaching in ten countries for the next few weeks the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask the Lord to send us, and this year he has pointed to the country south of the United States in what is generally known as the Caribbean area. Ten evangelistic crusades are being held by various members of our team, and then it will be my privilege to go from country to country preaching to the Christian workers, universities, civic groups, and in great stadium meetings. We are going to need the prayers of the Lord's people everywhere. I'm going to ask you to begin earnestly beseeching the throne of grace that God will send a spiritual awakening to the Caribbean area. Already the campaign's underway, and the early reports indicate that the Spirit of God is moving mightily. This is one of the greatest evangelistic efforts ever conducted in the Caribbean area. We need your prayers, and the Spirit of God has directed us in answer to our cry, Send us. Yes, saved searched, shown, strengthened, and sent. If you will dare to cry with Peter, save me. With David, search me. With Moses, show me. With Samson, strengthen me. And with Isaiah, send me. Your life will be enriched and your world in which you move will come to know him whom to know is life eternal. Ladies and gentlemen, right beside your radio where you're sitting or standing or riding in your car, wherever you are across this planet of ours, you can surrender and commit your life to Jesus Christ and then follow him in a life of obedience. You can do it right today. Many of you have written in and said, what must I do? 
All you have to do is surrender and commit your life and heart to Christ. Make him Lord and Master and Savior. Let him have the preeminent place in your life. And you too can know the joy and the peace and the strength that Christ can give. Many of you have problems today that need solving. Many of you have burdens that need to be lifted. Many of you are frustrated and confused. I guarantee on the authority of the Bible, peace and joy and happiness such as you have never known. And a solution to every problem if you will bring it to the foot of the cross of Christ. Will you do it? If you will, bow your head right now. I'm going to pray for you. Our Father and our God, we pray for that struggling individual, that burdened soul, that despairing heart at this moment as they put their quiet trust in Jesus Christ. We pray that thou wouldst touch their lives and may they know the surge of power that comes only through the Holy Spirit. For we ask it in his name. Amen.